Hello and welcome to Cloud Speed by Deloitte. In this regular podcast series, we'll delve into the world of cloud, answering some of those tricky questions, getting to grips with all that cloud has to offer, and keeping you up to speed on recent developments. So let's begin, shall we? Here is your host, Adam Gogarty. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Adam Gogarty, a director in our cloud engineering practice here at Deloitte, and, and I'll be your host for this first episode of Cloud Speed. So really, there's there's just no doubt that the last six months have been a huge experiment for, for all of us in the future of work. And, and recent events have rapidly accelerated that shift to the future of work, and, and cloud has played a, a huge part in enabling that transition. So today, for our first episode, we thought we'd delve into that a little bit deeper and really explore just how cloud is enabling the future of work. And to answer that question, I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague Yasser Butt, a director in our digital workplace team here at Deloitte. Hi, happy to be here. And Gordon Lavery from our digital workplace team. Hello, Adam. Thanks for having me. Excited to have made the cut for this debut podcast. <laughs> Fantastic. So, so Yasser and Gordon, look, thank you for joining me today. A fascinating topic for our first episode of Cloud Speed. But before we delve in, I'll, I'll let you both introduce yourselves to our listeners quickly. Thank you, Adam. Um, as you mentioned already, um, I lead our digital workplace capability within Deloitte. And we really support and work with a lot of our, our clients to, to help them navigate uh, through all of the digital tools and technologies that are really enabling and making the future of work happen. And hello again, uh, I'm Gordon. I work with Yasser. Um, I'm also in that digital workplace team and I'm delighted to be here because this is a topic close to my heart. Most of my day to day is spent working with clients on their employee experience challenges and specifically how they would use tools like cloud as an enabler to help solve some of them. So it's a topic I could quite happily talk anyone's ears off about. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So I guess to start us off, Gordon, what do we mean by the future of work? Big, big opening question. For, for the most part, when I talk about future work, what I'm really talking about is really just um, how work itself changes in relation to shifts in actual the tasks that people are doing, changes to the worker who might actually be completing those tasks, and changes to the workplace. Um, and whilst traditionally we think of the workplace as a very physical thing, we really have seen the shift towards the digital. And when we're talking about future work, often we're talking in relation to specific external shocks. So, for example, COVID is the obvious current external shock, but others might include things like automation, uh, the rise of space as a service, explosion of data that we now have access to, contingent work plans. There's so many more. Um, but when we actually talk about what the market come to us um, to support with, it's normally about how do organisations make deliberate, human-centred and data-driven decisions around what they actually want work to be in their organisation, and, and then how we enable that, which is often where we then talk about cloud. And it's a fascinating space. So I guess, yeah, so how, how is cloud actually enabling this shift to, to the future of work? Then? Well, I think it's enabling this shift in a, in a number of different ways. For example, pretty much all of the, the capabilities that you know, are really enabling the future of work are, of course, driven from cloud-based digital tools. And it's really the power of cloud that's allowing organizations to deliver these at an absolutely unprecedented pace. I mean, by some estimates, we're probably already about five years further along uh, in the future for future of work than, than we expect it to be today. Um, and of course, cloud systems, by their very nature of being much more connected and, and be able to process vast amounts of data and putting really putting that in the fingertips of, of employees means that they're really shaping the actual work that those employees are doing and allowing them to focus on much more value-based uh, work. I mean, I've certainly felt a change right over over the last six to eight months. I think it's fair to say we've we've seen an increase in the, in the use of cloud in that in that period. I guess, yeah, yeah. So, how, yeah, how did you see organisations, you know, really using cloud to respond to to the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, beyond, I, I guess the, the the usual headlines that we've seen in the explosion in, in collaboration or cloud based collaboration tools across all sectors and industries, you know, we've seen organisations put entire contact centres uh, into cloud, which traditionally, of course, have always been very much fixed place uh, local location based working for for contact centre workers, and it's only through that with the cloud they've been able to really do this and do this at a at the required pace uh, that was necessary to meet the pandemic. I mean, yeah, that's where 
I suppose seeing clients, I suppose, get over that respond phase. You know, Gordon, I guess, what are you seeing organisations planning to do as, as they go you know, through the recovery phase and, and beyond? I think it's a really interesting, um, really interesting question. I, I've a couple of times thought about if I was a change management person who'd spent the last two years fruitlessly banging my head against uh, the wall trying to get some of these products adopted in my organisation, I don't know whether I'd have laughed or cried about the last six months. Um, and I, but I think the key thing there is that actually what we'd seen over the last couple of years is that technology isn't really the lagging factor mm-hmm. in a lot of this nowadays. And I think that's really key when we think about what organizations should do when they start looking at the recovery phase and beyond. And probably before I go any further, I should probably acknowledge that there's a lot of pressure on organizations to do things quickly. Uncertainty is generally not good for business. Um, but in a perfect world, I think that a lot more companies would still be surveying the landscape and trying to look at the data that is being generated in the ways that people are currently working um, and really trying to to be really purposeful and deliberate in what they do next. But there are a few things that do jump out to me, um, one of which would be Yasser talked about the fact that we're seeing lots of usage of collaboration and productivity platforms. But turning that usage into true adoption and getting the most out for the, the the licensing and things that organizations have purchased i think there's, there's definitely something there um the future of the workplace physical and digital i think that's a really huge topic that organizations are going to have to grapple with um are they going to maintain a physical first or physical as the primary way to organize work landscape as we move forward or are they going to start to shift to a more hybrid or possibly digital first model Um, And lastly, I think there's a a really big thing about the customer, whether that's external facing or employees, so internal facing, if the physical doesn't return to what we had previously seen. Um, And a lot of organizations need to think about what that does to their customer experience and their employee experience and how they continue to deliver on those. Yeah, I mean, it does mean certainly, of course, um, that this reduction in, in reliance on this physical space is making the digital workplace actually now take centre stage for quite a few organisations as really the place where where work gets done. And obviously, I guess the you know the workplace depends on the industry you're in. So, so I guess Gordon, you know, how do you see different industries using cloud as they they embrace the future of work? You know, are there any particular trends or patterns that, that we've seen? Yeah, I think what's interesting when we talk about industries is that actually what we tend to see is that the the contextual differences really comes to the fore here so when we talk about things like a financial services industry where people tend to be very connected to the physical workspace they would tend to be at their desks um, or, or their digital workplace offerings might be based around things like virtualized desktops they've had to shift very quickly as a result of things like the shocks from, from COVID-19 um, and therefore they respond in a very different way to if we took ourselves as an example a kind of professional services based industry where lots of us had the tools to work remotely already. Um, we, we were used to working across different locations and in different working patterns. The one thing I do think is quite interesting though, um, around when we talked about trends, is I think employee experience as a driver has been a big trend. And it tends to mean that lots of these conversations, though they inevitably reach cloud as the enabler, don't start with cloud as often as they might previously have done. People aren't necessarily always coming to us with an infrastructure challenge. They might be coming to us with a we're struggling with talent retention or we're struggling to attract the type of worker we want to reach. And we work with them to design employee experience enabled by cloud and cloud capabilities. Brilliant. And I guess one trend I hear a lot about is, you know, bots and artificial intelligence on the cloud. So I guess, so what's really going on with these right now, you know, and I guess how are they changing how we work? Well, cloud-based bots are are, are very common now in support, uh, I mean, the other day, I think a bot helped me choose a very nice dishwasher uh, in, in a matter of minutes, which would have taken probably uh, hours for me to research. So although that's quite common at the moment in the support function, but we do expect them to be a, a lot more prevalent throughout the workplace over the coming years and really allowing us to focus on, on some value generating work while the bots are there to assist us uh, to do some more of the admin uh, work. Again, it's another area where I think it's really interesting that the technology is probably not, again, the lagging factor. In reality, the reason we probably don't all have bots doing our holiday bookings for us back in our SAP systems or whichever other vendor we might choose to use is probably because of policy or knowledge or the way the workflow is set up within our organization. So there's almost some non-technical but process debt 
that organizations would have to work through to try and enable some of these things. Um, and we know particularly, I mean, automation is coming um, and people are making their predictions about which industries are prone or not prone to automation. Those are predictions that don't always tend to have great accuracy when you look over the longer term. But either way, there's a big, big push for can organizations get their organizational policies in, in the right format to make use of bots? Can they get their workflows set up in the right way? Um, and we tend to see things like push to standard, um, which is quite a common trend at the moment with, with picking up larger cloud platforms where people don't want to do too much customization. Um, or if they do, they only want to tweak existing settings rather than build everything on the top, which they might previously have done. And I think that is a really interesting thing to think about. And, and the idea of a simplified but more modular architecture, which cloud enables, is, is a really positive step forward. Gordon, you, you made me think about my my favourite phrase, people, process and technology, you know, particularly in that order. I guess I guess what cultural shifts are you seeing you know, planned or otherwise as, as organisations adopt cloud? Um, I'm sure we'll both have a few things to, to list on this one. But um, for me, I think my main two would be, firstly, that we're not ignoring the, the people part as much as I would say traditional technology projects might have. So we saw the shift from individual product user experience through to kind of service experience. And now I think we're starting to look at more holistic user experience and employee experience, which means it's not just an afterthought or a buzzword. It's actually what's driving some of these decisions um, for some of our more forward thinking experience clients. And related to that, I think we are also seeing a big shift to almost everything being seen as a service which again, I think cloud has been a big accelerator of, um, but it's, it's not limited to cloud. So things like real estate as a service, we've seen the explosion of things like WeWork and similar client-based um, real estate organizations. And, and I think we'll just continue to see more and more things being offered as a service. Yes, and of course, technology is no longer being uh, seen as an excuse not to be able to do something. Um, I mean, cloud providers have invested very heavily over the last few years in regional services. So some of the more sort of traditional excuses for, for not being able to do something via technology or via cloud technologies due to possibly security or compliance or regulatory requirements uh, is, is really quite difficult to, to, to hold ground uh, given most uh, most regions now serve pool cloud services, including UK, Europe, uh, Asia, and of course the US. And of course, yes, you know, we, we live in an agile world, don't we? So you know, is is there actually an end to this transformation to to the future of work, or or will, will we never truly be done? <laughs> I, I don't think we'll, we'll ever be done. I mean, um, it, we we cannot be done because human nature is is to always strive for more, always always look for that that change to better ourselves. And as long as that drive is there, I think the the work will change, uh, meaning the future will continue. It's a very philosophical question, I think. I want. I wonder which part um, you or, or anyone listening thinks is more likely to disappear, the, the work part or the, <laughs> the advances? Fantastic discussion. Thank you so much for your, for your time, Gorn and Yasser, and Thank for joining you. me today. Um, really fascinating you know, to see how cloud has been enabling you know, this shift to the, to the future of work. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for having me. It's been really great and quite fascinating to go through this discussion today yeah agreed um i think it's a really exciting area and i'm looking forward to seeing what you've got in store next adam on the next installment brilliant brilliant but before we close you know today's podcast so i'd first like to hand over to our resident cloud contact center expert elliot chapel who's going to provide us with a quick update on recent developments within the cloud contact center space Hi, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Adam, for that intro. So I'm here to tell you today a little bit about what's been happening in the cloud contact center space lately. And I've got two main updates that I'd like to share with everyone, um, one directly from Amazon Web Services, and the other is a, the, about the tie-up between Salesforce and Amazon Web Services. So the first one, just the Amazon Web Services, is around the introduction of contact lens. So contact lens is essentially a free canned set of machine learning capabilities from Amazon that are directly integrated into their cloud-based telephony solution, Amazon Connect. It gives you the ability to do full text searches, sentiment analysis, so you can understand how people are feeling, how your customers are being engaged during your conversations. But it also gives you access to brand new powerful data that you as an organization can use to 
really get under the hood of how your customer relationships are working and what they're calling in for. Why are they contacting you? In addition to those great benefits, it also gives you a few good compliance additions as well. So it enables you to actually automatically redact sensitive data. So you are able to detect things like uh, PAN numbers, so credit card numbers, the dates of birth, GDPR compliant items, anything that could be sort of tied back to an individual can be automatically redacted out of any transcripts. It also gives you the ability to have real-time alerting, which is coming soon, not quite live yet, but coming in not too distant future, which means that supervisors within the call center will be able to be automatically alerted in the event of an issue being raised, a call not being handled correctly. And it just means that the overall experience is going to be a lot more personalized, a lot more beneficial, and it's sort of driving everyone towards sort of quick, satisfying outcomes instead of having to spend longer and longer on the calls. In addition to that, there's also been the release of neural voices, which mean that these bots that we're talking to more and more have actually started to become more conversational. So nowadays, if you if you log in, you can hear sort of Colonel Sanders talk to you from KFC. You can hear an Australian talk to you about National Australian Bank. And these, these are much more sort of coherent, inclusive, and natural sounding actual voices that are bot generated and run. The second key update I just want to go through is around the tie up between Amazon Web Services and Salesforce in order to deliver service cloud voice. The service cloud voice is effectively the really in-depth integration between AWS's Amazon Connect and Salesforce's service cloud. So what this means is that you can now do a full omni-channel capability from Salesforce. You can do voice, chat, email, et cetera, all from within the Salesforce dashboard using Amazon services behind the scenes. This gives you access to additional capabilities, customizations, you can pull data from your Salesforce um, and make the whole journey and customer interaction more personal, more preemptive. You can train it to identify what the person's calling about, as well as just better outcomes. And you don't lose any of the other features that we talked about with contact lens information being ported across into Salesforce as well. So those two updates are all for this episode, and I'll hand back over to Adam. Thank you, Elliot. So, so that concludes today's episode. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed listening. Please do reach out and connect with me on LinkedIn at Adam Gogarty. Or if you'd like to find out more about Deloitte's cloud capabilities, please visit our Deloitte website and search cloud what's your possible. In the meantime, though, I'm Adam Gogarty, and you've been listening to Cloud Speed by Deloitte. Thanks for tuning in.